Good morning. You have been in suspension for 50 days. In compliance with state and federal regulations, all testing candidates in the Aperture Science Extended Relaxation Center must be revived periodically for a mandatory physical and mental wellness exercise. Wow, Dante. <laughs> I love this game. You're able to hear us all you right? You have a fan right here. So we got Dante, Joe, Deborah, Daniel, Kareem, Andre, Alex, I'm Sam, uh, and up there on the screen, on our left, we've got Jay, I believe, your guy's Hi. right, and then Eric. Hi. Can you describe for us a day in the life of a video game writer? Every day we get to do something different. So some days we're writing, um, we're writing to on the internet about a game. Other times we're in the studio with actors recording the dialogue for games. Sometimes we're working with the level designers. Uh, we have just a lot of really talented level designers here, uh, and they'll be, you know, designing these huge levels that we can kind of come in and see how characters could interact with each other in that space. Um, what else do we do? I mean, it's all, it kind of depends on where you are in the game. You know, in the beginning, you're working with the team and the artists to just try and take the, the structure of the game and, and start thinking about, A, how you're going to tell the story, given the gameplay that's going to be in the game, and then B, sort of trying to loosely start hanging some sort of plot on it, which will evolve as, as the game evolves. And, uh, but so that there's a lot of just kind of planning in the beginning, and then eventually you're actually writing lines of dialogue and the script and the story, and then eventually you're casting the actors and recording the actors, and then you're cutting up all the audio. And we at least wire the audio into the game ourselves uh, right. just to have a little bit more control over it. Uh, I guess maybe just to tell you there the different types of jobs there are in video games. I mean, so we have programmers here, and they do nothing to build the engine that makes the code to make the make the games run. We have level designers that actually create the space you walk through. We've got artists who are designing everything from the environments, the costumes, to the characters. And then we kind of end up working with pretty much all the teams in some way or another. So imagine it's just like a, it's a big room with 30 to, to 60 people in it. They're all kind of working towards the same game. So if you could give people one piece of advice that you've learned through your careers when beginning a game design project, what would that be? So oh. small. <laughs> yeah, I mean, set your goals to something that you can actually accomplish, and then meet that small goal and release it and get some feedback on it. Like, that's the... When, when I was a kid and I was trying to make one game after another, they were always way too ambitious for what I could actually produce, and it ended up that I just never finished anything. And I never would have finished anything if I actually hadn't luckily gotten into the industry with, you know, people who could help me right. finish it and actually put some constraints on it. Like, put some hard constraints on it as if someone, you know, as if you actually had to ship it at some point. Uh, the other thing would be um, just to remember it, it's not going to be perfect. So, I mean, you obviously you want to, always want to strive towards perfection, but it won't be perfect. Uh, one of my coworkers, Kyle, he was saying to me the other day that if you could look on, back on something you did last year, and you're not seeing all the things you could have done better, it means you're not getting better. So you should always be aware that you know it's it's going to be yours and it's going to be good, but you don't have to make it perfect. You just have to try and, as Eric said, get some constraints and get something that you can play. Yeah, and if you want to make games, I mean, yeah, my advice to every if you want to be a game writer, no matter what you want to do, is learn learn some amount of coding. Like it's kind of the common language of everybody. Uh, and it's just super useful to be able to, you don't have to be, you know, an engine programmer or anything, but just being able to code a little, you know, in Java or C Sharp or whatever. Ask uh, well, what were your favorite games growing up that got you interested in maybe pursuing this one day? I mean, I'm old enough that it was literally Pong. <laughs> uh, I got the Sears Pong. It, I don't know why those two paths, it just blew me away. Like, it's, as soon as I saw it, that's all I wanted to do. Uh, it took me a while to get here, but yeah, I started with Pong. Uh, for me, it was probably actually games like Half-Life. Um, so I, I, I grew up when you know Doom and Quake were all the big games, and then kind of Half-Life came in and changed things and told me you can make something cinematic, you can make a story people care about, you can put characters in it. <coughs> now, 
I'd like to uh, invite the guys to ask some of their questions. Mm -hmm. Joseph, you had some great questions. Would you like to ask it yourself, or would you want me to ask it for you? Oh, well, my question was, what made you think of some of the characters to put in your game? Did you, like, take it from other games or made it from your own personal, like, your own mind by creating these characters? A lot of times it comes from need. Uh, so it, it's, it's less than I would say. You have one character, for instance, who is... A super, a super loud, super high energy character. Then, if you have another character playing off that, you're going to want contrast. You're going to be well. That may, second character, maybe that second character is going to be really inward and really shy and really quiet. So there's a lot of times. I mean, every character isn't created in a vacuum. A lot of times you can kind of be like, well, I've got this character. What would be an interesting character to play off that first character? Right? What would what would be a good contrast? What would get these some sparks flying against these characters? Hi, Dante. <laughs> Big fan of your game. Oh, thank um, you very much. What made you guys think of it, the companion cube? Uh, <laughs> um, actually, that that one was so that that's a good example of how the design and the writing interact. Uh, what we had was a level where, uh, and it was similar. It's basically what we shipped. Where you needed to drag that cube with you all the way to the end of the level, and what we found when people were playing it uh, before the story part got in is that they just wouldn't. There was no, <clears throat> they didn't really know that they needed to bring it with them, and so people would leave it behind and then get frustrated because they would think maybe they could solve the later part of the puzzle without the cube, or they'd realize they had needed it, and so now they'd have to backtrack and go get it. And it was the you know the Kind of the simplest thing, we had a problem and we solved it with the dialogue, which was the dialogue tells you very explicitly, like, you need, this is your friend, you need to keep this with you. Um, and so uh, that solved that. And then the thing about incinerating it came out of, it used to be in the very beginning, at the end of that level, you just left the companion cube there, and it was, I think GLaDOS said something about just abandoning it. But then later, uh, I don't know if you remember, at the very end of the game, you have to take uh, the uh, little balls off of GLaDOS and throw them in the incinerator, and we're like, ah, we never show, we never taught anyone that there are incinerators that you can throw things in, and it was just, it just occurred to us, that that's amazing point where the companion cube is, that we'll put an incinerator there, force you to incinerate the companion cube, and it'll be a good story thing, and it'll also teach you that there are incinerators that you can throw things in. So it was just, yeah, it's a, just a really good example of the writing and the gameplay sort of informing each other. Your enemies, I noticed that they're robots, but they cannot move. Um, were you planning on doing something with that? You mean uh, like the turrets and stuff? Yes. Yes. So it part of it was no. We, at no point at the in Portal Two there are. Uh, in later in the game, there's the Franken turrets that can move a little bit. <clears throat> but generally speaking, just because of the, the game design, uh, it was a puzzle to be solved. Once the robots started moving around, it became a lot less uh, deterministic in the sense that uh, it was tougher to construct and then also to solve the puzzles in the way we wanted uh, YouTube, so that there there was a the gameplay kind of imposed a constraint on the robots as far as why they didn't move, which kind of goes against the Frankenturts, but the Frankenturts sort of barely moved, and it was kind yeah, of scripted. Kind of, yeah, yeah, they, they didn't around, move, yeah. move too much. I like your game because how you made your mind go open. That's what made me like this game because mostly games have like guns that like shoot and kill and maybe annihilate other people, but this one took it like to a next level. It's like not in a million years I have ever thought of or heard of a portal gun. So that's what made me feel like, man, what made these guys get so much of these ideas. So it's really uh, the level designers uh, can take the credit for that one. They yeah. worked really hard at ramping it up so 
they'll introduce the idea of a new mechanic, a new game mechanic to you, and then they'll very slowly over the course of a couple levels show you how to use it. So the idea is it's, it's interesting how they do it. Where rather than just hitting you with a million stuff at once, they'll hit you with one idea and make sure you learn it and then move on to the next one and move on to the next one. So you can really look at both of the portals. You can kind of step back and look at it. It's, it's always slowly moving you one step forward, so you always kind of get that really great eureka moment at the end of them. And also the, the uh, game that formed the basis for Portal was a student project from a, a game design school here called DigiPen. And uh, some people from Valve went to their uh, student showcase and saw this really rough version of Portal um, and were just blown away by it, kind of the way you were blown away by it, and hired them, like, not quite on the spot, but almost on the spot, to turn it into what eventually became Portal. Where, where do you find your inspiration for games? Because I know you've got strong backgrounds in comedy, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, you're paraphrasing poetry of maybe Emily Dickinson and several other uh, poets in your games. But like, you're looking at a lot of different stuff other than just you know, the latest you know, AAA game title. Is it important for you to like, find inspiration everywhere and be able to translate that into the world of game design? Hmm, I mean... I guess you're always a bit of a magpie with that kind of stuff uh, in anything creative. There's just little things that you, you'll you read and you'll want to file away for later. It's always nice to have a notepad or even just, you know, a, a notepad dock on your, on, your, on your PC or something where you just jot down stuff. I think it's more the idea of if you're always writing down your ideas, you'll know when a good one gets to you because there's nothing worse than that moment where you're trying to remember that, that great idea you had three years ago or three three months ago and you can't quite remember it. So I would definitely – you don't know when a good idea is going to be found. Yeah, and I, I think we take inspiration – I mean, just like anybody in anything, I would imagine, taking inspiration from everything, you know, especially when you're working on a project – I know I do this. I think Jay does it too. You put up this kind of filter when you're really in the middle of it. That's like everything that you see in here is processed through this filter of can I use this in the thing we're working on. Right. Um, I mean, also, yeah, because we do comedy, we tend to not watch comedies, especially during writing, because you don't want to be accidentally taking stuff. So I read yeah. a lot of I read a lot of nonfiction, a lot of history, uh, just anything that can spark some inspiration. But anything but sitting down and watching. Also, you know, family guy or yeah, something. it's really good comedy. Because <laughs> when you're writing it, you just think it stinks for the most part. Because you're <laughs> so right. if it's good comedy, you're depressed because it's good and your stuff sucks. And <laughs> the bad comedy, I always do this where I'm like, oh, that's just like this yeah. comedy's terrible, and it's just the structure is just the same as the jokes we're telling. And there's so no, we suck. So either way, we yeah. suck. There's nothing worse than you go record a line, you're in love with it, you get it in the game, and you're play testing, and someone's like, oh yeah, like that Simpsons line. Yeah, and that's the first thing. Everything eventually, yeah, you steal from the Simpsons accidentally. Um, or Emily Dickinson. Yeah, the Emily Dickinson, you can you can pull in because that's the public domain. I mean, this just came to me. Um, what made you like have the idea to like design like the battleground or platform of the game Portal Two? Yeah. So is it the world like, that you're interested in? Yeah, the setting? world. Like usually it's in maybe like a lab that does like robots, but this one is like an underground. Like this is what I thought was like an underground. I could tack one thing onto that. What I thought was really interesting, interesting, pardon me, was they referred to the game that Portal was based on, this is our backyard drop, I think it's called, yeah. which is about a princess escaping from a, a dungeon, and you guys really, you know, you took the mechanic of that, of teleporting, but it's in a completely new setting, obviously. Um, was that, were you involved in kind of repurposing the world of Narbacular Drop, or did you only come in later in the process? Uh, no, I was there for that. Uh, and that, again, kind of, uh, you know, you make decisions based on some constraints, and <clears throat> what happened with Portal was uh, it was a really small team that the, you know, I think it was seven students from DigiPen, and there just wasn't going to be enough time or resources to do a complete 
uh, art pack, you know, to do the art from scratch. So we had all this Half-Life uh, art, which is, you know, all this great Half-Life stuff, which we could use as the basis for, like, 80% of it if we put it in the Half-Life universe. So that's basically what, what drove that decision was a practical just not being able to create enough art to fill a whole game. Um, and then once we started doing that, uh, we put the computer voice in as just a way to kind of keep people going. And it was almost like a placeholder until we figured out what the story was. But people sort of got attached to the voice who were playtesting it. And it, at some point it occurred to us that in a puzzle game like that, your enemy is actually the environment. I mean, it's the facility itself. And then we thought, well, this voice is the voice of the facility, so let's make her the actual villain of the piece, this voice that you've been hearing. So, you know, again, these ideas just evolve over time. They rarely arrive fully formed. Never arrive fully formed, I don't think. I believe it was Portal 2 when your main character was a female, correct? Both, they're both, they're the same character. both of them? Yes. So, um, I'd just like to uh, understand why it was a female. Are you trying to go like with the, was it Samus? Hmm? Samus? Yeah. Yeah, Samus yeah. Aaron. Are you trying to go with like that type of thing when everyone thought it was like a guy and it turns out it was a girl or? Uh, well, no, because you can basically see yourself right from the very first few seconds of, uh, of well, both games. Well, not, not maybe not the first, second one, but the first one you get, you have a portal guy. It, the portals open up and you can see yourself. You know, honestly, it was people read a lot more into that decision than it really was. We were a small group. We you had to make somebody had to be the main character, and it's just one of the you know thousands of creative decisions you need to make. And I don't remember us thinking more about it than if, well, I don't see a lot of women as heroes. Anybody have a problem if it's a woman? And you know, there was only like eight of us, but we said no, and that decision was made, and we. You know, we kind of moved on. Okay. After that decision was made, it didn't affect how you write the game or sort of treat her behavior at all. It was a non-issue. No. That no, I mean, uh, I mean, the character's silent. So we did. Uh, you know, th there's so some of the dynamic, especially in Portal Two, came out a little bit more. Right. Uh, where, uh, just because people had made a big deal that there was a female lead, we made some references to that in Portal Two. I think we made a few jokes somewhere along the line right. about that. Out. But, I mean, for the most part, the character is meant to be an avatar for you. She doesn't speak. You do rarely see her, uh, which makes it a lot more immersive when you're playing the game. So, I mean, it's not something that's... It's something that's it's there, and I think people have responded really positively to it. But it's also... It's you, it's me, it's everybody when you play it. Are you trying to make an online game? Well, Valve does make uh, a bunch of... Uh, you know, we've got Team Fortress, we've got Dota, we've got Counter Strike Go. Yep. Uh, uh, Dota right now, Dota Two. That's uh, sorry, Dota Two. And uh, Portal itself was technically you know, there's a co-op part. So yeah, so, yes. Hi again. <laughs> uh, how would one get a job designing games? Well, so the biggest thing is, is you, you know, unlike being a brain surgeon or a lawyer or something, you don't actually have to be credentialed. Like, the way you get a job is give yourself that job. Like, mm -hmm. make a game. It is the best way to get notice. Make a yep. game, release it, uh, it'll get popular, or, or it won't, but, you know, it's it goes back to the very first question you were asking. I mean, giving yourself constraints and just trying to do something, and then go make something else and make it better, and that's your resume. I mean... Ultimately, the people that impress us, the people we hire, the people that become great game makers, become that by making games. You know. The other thing is with the rise of digital distribution, like make your game, and you know, if it catches on, you may not even need somebody to give you a job. Like just right. make it, you'll sell it, and you'll make your next game. Having said that, learning the skills, uh, doing it is is a really good way to learn how to do it. Um, but, you know, stuff like DigiPen, I, I'm not really shilling for DigiPen, but DigiPen is a great place to learn, uh, you know, the, the basics of, of making games. Uh, and I know a lot of you know, colleges have programs, but, you know, honestly, just use you get a copy of Unity, it's free, sit down. I mean, it's a real 
So it sounds like a real tool. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you guys are kind of on your way anyway, doing some experiments. So I think just just stick with it. Stick with it. Right on. Okay. okay. Well, that is, I think, a fabulous note to end on. So, Eric and Jay, we really, really appreciate <laughs> you guys taking the time out of your day to talk to us. Um, so, best of luck and congratulations on the massive success of the Portal games, and best wishes with all you're working on now. Right, guys? Good luck. I'm your biggest fan. <laughs> Enjoy this next test. I'm going to go to the surface. It's a beautiful day out. Yesterday I saw a deer. If you solve this next test, maybe I'll let you ride an elevator all the way up to the break room. And I'll tell you about the time I saw a deer again.